Well, good morning, church family. Good morning. I appreciate that. <laughs> wow. Thank you for that. Well, it's always good to be in the house of the Lord today. I'm going to be uh, giving a personal a couple of thoughts here. This, The last 10 days have been uh, very uh, emotional for me and bittersweet, and I'll share with you why. My mother's birthday was on February 13th. She passed on February 18th of last year. And one year ago today, February 23rd, Crystal and I were in Delaware, laying mom to rest next to dad. So it has been an emotional time for me, and it has been bittersweet. But you know what? I also glorify God. I also thank God because mom is home in heaven with Jesus. She was 82 when she left, and she had several ailments. She was tired. She was ready to go. And the last time I had seen her, I could see that she was losing steam and life was slowly seeping out of her. But I can rejoice today because I know one day I'll see mom again, as I'll see dad again. And they're reunited in heaven. And so even though there's been a few tears this week, and even though it's been bittersweet, I can still stand before you and tell you I'm going to glorify God. And that's why this passage I'm going to preach on today is even more focused on myself, but I want to share it with you too. Let's go before the throne. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for the word that you're going to bring today. We thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing in our life, Lord, and forgive us for those times that we do not thank you for the things in our life, for the people in our life, for the miracles in our life, for all the times that you provide for us, Lord. Forgive us for that. Bless us now as we go into your word. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable unto you, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. If you'll take your Bibles and turn to Luke 17, we are going to be looking at a miracle of Jesus. But this isn't just any old miracle. This is a very unique miracle. And if I do my job right, I'll explain to you exactly why it's unique. We'll be looking at Luke 17 verses 11 through 19 today. And what I would like to do is do two things. I'm going to read it all the way through so that we have it in context. Then I want to walk you through it historically, what was happening. And then we're going to apply this passage to our lives because there's something here for all of us today. Amen? So here we are, Luke 17, beginning in verse 11. While he was on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered the village, ten leprous men, who stood at a distance, met him. And they raised their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourself to the priest. And as they were going, they were cleansed. Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this stranger? And he said to them, Stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. well let's take a look at this. We find Jesus this morning on his way to Jerusalem, which was in the south. It says he was passing between Samaria and Galilee, and if you know your map of the Holy Land, Jesus was heading south. He started north, and he had to come through an area in the middle of the country known as Samaria. That's important that we understand that. In the Gospels, we read about the Samaritans a number of times. There's a reason for that. I hope to bring that out shortly. And so we see Jesus coming down, and in verse 12, we see him entering the village. We're not told what the name of the village is, so we don't know exactly where this takes place, but he enters into a village. And while he's entering into the village, what does he find but ten men with leprosy who stood far off from him? Now, we all know what leprosy is. Leprosy is a terrible skin disease. And when it gets really bad, parts of your body start falling off. For the longest time, it was incurable. There's still leprosy in parts of the world. But what you want to understand here about leprosy is that according to the Old Testament, if you had leprosy, 
You could not be among people. You could not be in the village. You could not be around people. And so we see Jesus as he's entering this village. It would make perfect sense that there's 10 leprous men standing afar off. And if you're taking notes and you want to know where this is all about, Leviticus chapter 13 tells us all about leprosy and what the procedure is. And if you go down to verse 46, we'll look at that today. If you go down to verse 46 of Leviticus 13, it specifically says that anyone who has leprosy must be kept outside the camp, outside the village, away from people. It makes perfect sense that Jesus is entering the village, but these leprous men are not in the village. They're standing nearby. It says here in verse 12, they stood afar off the distance and they met him. Don't be misunderstood. They didn't come up and shake his hand. They had leprosy. They weren't allowed near. What they did was they met him. They came into Jesus' sight. Imagine you're walking and you see a crowd over here. Eventually it's going to catch your sight. Now once Jesus sees them, look what happens in verse 13. To get Jesus' attention, it says they raised their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. You can imagine, here's Jesus coming down, and they're shouting, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Over here, we're over here. The Greek word for master is rabboni, rabbi. What they were essentially saying is, Jesus, Rabbi Jesus, have mercy on us. Have compassion on us. Look on us. See us? Look what Jesus does in verse 14. When he saw them, all of their shouting got their attention. Sometimes it's okay to shout to God. Sometimes it's okay to be loud with God. Sometimes it's okay to say, God, I'm right here. I need your attention. Amen. And so Jesus looks at them. Verse 14. When he saw them, it says, he said to them. Now this is where the miracle is unique. This is where it's different. Verse 14. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priest. Now that in and of itself is not the miraculous part, because if you understand this, and let me explain how this works. When you had leprosy, you had to go to a priest, and they had to pronounce you clean. And only when they pronounced you clean could then you come back into society and back into the village. And that's why these ten men were outside the village. They had not pronounced clean. Now, they did not have to go to Jerusalem to do that. Any priest in any village was qualified to pronounce someone clean. Now, we're not told exactly where they go, and ultimately that is not important. But what we want to see here, and if you're taking notes again, if you read the next chapter of Leviticus, Leviticus 14, tells you all about the procedure in the first 32 verses, and I encourage you to read that to fill in this story. The Leviticus 14 tells you exactly the procedure where they have to go to the priest, the ritual to be cleansed, and then to be pronounced clean so they can come back into society. So what Jesus was telling them as a rabbi and as a teacher of the law was perfectly right. Go and show yourself to the priest. But wait a minute. They're not healed yet. See, normally what Jesus would be doing in his miracles, he would heal someone first and then tell them to do something or not to do something. He heals the blind eyes and then he says, don't tell anybody, my time isn't here yet. Or he unstops ears. This is the first time that I'm aware of in scripture where Jesus is actually saying, go and show yourself to the priest, but they're not healed yet. He didn't touch them yet. He didn't pronounce healing over them yet. And yet he said, go. Jesus is testing them. Jesus is testing them the same way he tests us. Now watch what happens. Here's where the miracle happens in the very next part of verse 14. As they were going, they were cleansed. As they were going, did you catch that? They left. When Jesus said, go and show yourself to the priest, they left leprous men. And as they went, some point they were cleansed. All ten of them healed. That's what makes this miracle unique. All ten healed. As they were going, they were cleansed. Now, we don't know how far into the journey they were cleansed. Ultimately, 
It's not important where it happened. The important thing is it happened. The important thing is all ten men were cleansed. They went away believing Jesus. They went away believing, and if he said, go show yourself to the priest, and they would have understood what that meant, that they would have had to be clean at some point. That was faith. That was faith. But did their faith follow all the way through? Well, no. Because as we see the story here, let's move to verse 15. Now, one of them, it says in verse 15, when he saw that he had been healed, he could look at himself and realize he's clean. When he saw that he was clean, when he was healed, when Jesus had healed him, what did he do? He turned back. Now remember, ten left. Only one's coming back. Only one. When he'd been healed, he turned back. And I want you to see what this man does. Because it's a series of things that we do, and I wonder how often, when God does things for us in our life, do we have these kinds of reactions? Watch what this man does. One of them, when he saw that he'd been healed, the evidence was right there. He turned back. That's number one. Number two, he glorified God with a loud voice. He didn't come back crawling. He didn't come back looking around. He made a noise. Amen. He glorified God with a loud voice. He wasn't afraid to shout it out. He glorified God. How often are we just a little too quiet? A little too passive. When Jesus does something for us, and we just don't glorify God, we don't shout. This man is not afraid to shout. That's the first thing he did. He glorified God with a loud voice. Watch what else he does. Verse 16. He fell on his face. That's the next thing he did. He fell on his face at Jesus' feet. And you may think, oh, wait a minute, that's kind of peculiar, isn't it? Now remember, he's healed now. So he can come near Jesus. He's clean. He's been pronounced clean. He can be back in society. And so he glorifies God with a loud voice, and he falls at Jesus' feet. But he's not done yet. Then it says, he gave thanks to him. He gave thanks. If you were healed, wouldn't you give thanks to God? Amen. Wouldn't you glorify God? Wouldn't you maybe fall at the feet of Jesus? Amen. Guess what? He's healed every one of us from our sin condition. He's healed every one of us. If we profess to be true born-again believers, we're already healed in our soul experience. We already have eternal life. We already have that gift of eternal life. Are we glorifying God about this? Are we falling at his feet? Are we thanking him for these things? Or are we just going about our way? Are we just going about our life? Now, there's a peculiar thing here at the end of verse 16, after we see all of this happen. It says, and he was a Samaritan. Mm -hmm. Why is that important? Why would God just kind of throw, it seems kind of innocuous. There's ten lepers men, ten lady, one comes back, he falls at Jesus' feet, and he's a Samaritan. It doesn't make sense. Well, actually, it does make sense. Why is it mentioned? You have to understand historical context. The Jews hated the Samaritans. According to the Jews, the Samaritans were unrighteous. They were unholy people. They weren't pious like the Jews. They didn't carry themselves with holiness like the Jews. What is Jesus showing us here? He's showing us two things. Number one, that a Samaritan or a Gentile, or anyone else can be just as holy and just as thankful to God as the Jews thought they were. Amen. That's why he's a Samaritan. Now, we do not know, of the ten, how many were Jews and how many were Samaritans. Ultimately, that doesn't matter. What God is showing us is the one that came back was not one of these pious Jewish men. He was a Samaritan. He was somebody who was considered unholy and unclean. That's one reason. I think the other reason is this. That Jesus was shown. Remember, Jesus came to his own, the Bible says, and his own rejected him. He came to his own people and they didn't want him. And so the gospel went out through people like the Apostle Paul. Jesus is trying to show us here that the gospel is for everyone. 
The gospel goes out to all the nations. The same way he told the apostles in Acts 1, you're going to receive power and it's going to go out from Jerusalem to Samaria to other parts, other most parts of the world. The gospel goes around the world. And what Jesus is showing us here is, here is a Samaritan who wouldn't even have been considered a holy man, a righteous man, a thankful man, and he's the one that's laying at Jesus' feet. I hope you can see that. That's why that's put in there. Now, Jesus is going to ask two very important questions in the next verse, and I want you to see them clear. Verse 17, And Jesus answered, and he said, Where there are not ten cleansed. Now, think about that statement. Jesus sent them away. They were out of his eyesight. They were healed at some point. And yet Jesus, being Almighty God, can say, weren't there ten cleansed? Jesus knew what he did. He healed all ten of them. But here's the question for all of us. But the nine, where are they? Where are the nine? They were all healed equally. They all got the same blessing from God. Only one came back. Jesus is asking, where are the nine? We're going to, we'll circle back to that in a moment. Where are the nine? What happened to them? Jesus asked another question here in verse 18. Look at it. He says, Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this, this stranger? Was no one found to give glory to God? Understand this. This Samaritan who fell down at Jesus' feet. Remember earlier they called him Rabbi. Rabbi Jesus. Jesus, Master. Yet he fell at Jesus' feet. Jesus is trying to tell us he's eternal God himself right in this question here. He's saying, was no one found who returned to give glory to God? Who gave glory to God? The Samaritan who's laying at Jesus' feet. He gave glory to God and by praising Jesus, he was giving glory to God because Jesus is eternal God himself. Jesus is almighty God himself. And Jesus is asking all of us that question. You're going to give glory to God, you give it to Jesus Christ, our Savior. He's the one that paid our sins on the cross. He's the one that gives us eternal life. He is the one that guaranteed all of our sins would be paid for when he died on Calvary. And so Jesus is asking, was no one found to give glory to God except this man who's laying at my feet? I want you to see what happens because this man came back and gave glory to God. Verse 19. Watch this. Here's salvation right in front of your eyes. He says to him, get up, rise up, stand up. Your faith has made you well. Amen. The other nine, they were made well, physically. They didn't return to give glory to God. This man was well physically and spiritually. Amen. His faith had saved him. His Amen. faith had saved him. The other nine, went off, went back to their villages or wherever it is they were going to go, get back into society, and they were healed. This man <laughs> took the extra step to glorify God, to thank Jesus for it, and as a result of that, he received eternal life right there. It doesn't say eternal life, but my Bible says, and I can prove it in other passages, your faith has made you well. You are no longer sin sick. You're not just physically well, you are spiritually well. That is salvation right there. Amen. But Jesus is asking this question today. And I'm going to share something personal with you. Those of you who watch me online, and some of you I know do, you know that I like to be transparent. I don't like to hold anything back because you need to know who I am. Not just someone who comes up here and preaches the word and doesn't live it and doesn't tell you my faults. When I was reading this, especially after these last 10 days of dealing with emotions regarding my mother, but also realizing that I could glorify God. That's why I started this message with that. I understand what this one man was doing. I understand that he would come back to Jesus and glorify God and thank him for what happened the same way that I can thank God and thank Jesus for my salvation, the fact that my mother is in heaven, the fact that my father is in heaven, and I'm going to see them again one day. But here's what I want to confess to you. And this is where we all have to examine our own hearts. How many times in our life are we one of the nine? Hmm. 
Generally, just focus on the one. I'm sure you've heard this passage preached many times. So have I over my 30 years or so being a Christian. I don't want to focus on the one. Everybody focuses on the one. I want to focus on the nine. How many of us, if we really think about it, when we think of everything that God has done in our life, how many times have we not thanked God? How many times have we not glorified God? How many times have we not fallen down to feet and said, Jesus, just thank you. Thank you. Those of you who, and, and this is not about me, every morning I post the same sentence because it sets my mind for the day. And it says this, thank you, Lord Jesus, for another day of life and another day to serve you. Ruby's, Ruby's nodding, she sees it. I post that first thing every morning. It's not about me. Because if I live tomorrow, Jesus gave me another day of life and another day to serve him however he wants. I can glorify God and I can be grateful. But I want to tell you, there are many times in my life, and I still struggle with this, particularly, Crystal and I had several petitions before the Lord. We've had several very serious matters that we brought before the Lord. We have not received answers yet. And it's real easy to get upset with God, to get mad with God, to say, God, you're not listening to me. You must be on the other side of the world dealing with something over there. You're not listening to me. And we forget. And when I was studying this passage, I thought, Lord, forgive me how many times I'm in the nine and I'm not the one. And God convicted me to speak, Thomas, you are in the nine too many times. Hmm. Yes, you can write something on a screen, and yes, you can say, thank you, Lord, but are you truly grateful? Are you truly thankful? Are you truly glorifying God? All of us, myself included, we must ask that question of ourselves. As we go about our day, we get busy with work and with family. Our jobs take a lot of time. We're figuring out our finances. We're dealing with all kinds of things in this fast-paced world. How many times do we stop and just glorify God and just say, thank you, God, for what you did? Even if he didn't answer a prayer today. Even if all of our bills are not paid. Even if we still have that malady that won't go away. Can we still glorify God or we only glorify God when he does something miraculous for us? We're here today. We should be glorifying God today. We shouldn't be afraid to raise our voices. Jesus saved us from an eternity in hell. Isn't that worth raising your voice about? Isn't that worth glorifying God about? That's what God convicted me of this week as I was preparing this message. Thomas, you need to be more of a one and less of the nine. Let me leave that with you. We all need to be more of the one and less of the nine. Amen? Would you bow your heads with me? Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this message today. It was brief, but Lord, we pray that it convicted our hearts. Lord, help us to be the one that glorifies you, that's not afraid to shout out with a loud voice that we love you and we thank you for what you've done. We're not afraid to fall at your feet. We're not afraid to just worship you for all that you've done. And Lord, we just thank you for what you have done on the cross of Calvary. You didn't have to die for any of us. You didn't have to take our sins upon yourself. You didn't have to shed one drop of blood, but you did. Because you love us. Because you care about us. Because you want a relationship with us. Because you want to spend eternity with us. Lord, forgive us for those times that we don't glorify you. That we don't thank you. That we don't praise you. That we allow the world to take all of our thoughts and all of our time and give you the crumbs that are left at the end of the day. Father, forgive us for that. Help us to be the one and not part of the nine. This is our prayer this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.